told this story in a very long time. You'll have to forgive me if I have trouble keeping it straight. six weeks before in the dead of night. I started awake when the door closed, but I drifted back to sleep immediately. I woke up covered in dew. I looked out the window to see the sun breaking over the horizon. The automobile was gone. I showered, got dressed, and took the bus to work. same dream over and over again. A figure stood on a far away hilltop. It beckoned to him. I asked him if the figure always wanted him. He told me that the figure either wanted him or someone standing directly behind him. Which one is worse? sitting at my kitchen table across from an empty chair when the doorbell rang. Surprised, I dropped my coffee cup and it shattered on the floor. I threw the door open expecting Eric to be there. A delivery boy with a letter stood before me. I read it to myself, moving my lips to cement it in my memory. It was a short missive. Come to me. I found it. The return address read Kesselbrook. I bought the train ticket that afternoon. I shattered the lock of Eric's desk drawer five days after he left. His absence had driven me to find any and every remnant of him that I could. His notebooks were there. He scribbled constantly, privately filling volume after volume. Every few months I would catch him writing and ask him about it. He would smile beautifully before changing the subject. Sometimes he would refer to his history in casual conversation, never elaborating. It was strange at first, but it became our rhythm, an untold secret. So I ignored whatever was in that desk drawer until the hammer drove it open. I 
I read the notebooks on the train. His handwriting traced out the contours of the page, curving with the once wet paper in a way that made it seem like he had summoned the words from the sheets themselves. It was organized like an encyclopedia, and each entry told the story of another arcane place, object, or person. There was a record of the families who had lived on a single acre of land in the north of France. There was an oral history of a Turkish city. There were ten pages on a pitchfork that changed hands during strange moments of history. The stories refused to cohere for me and I wondered why Eric had put it all together. journals Eric left was devoted to Kesselbrook itself. The town the train delivered me to was not the first Kesselbrook, and the maps Eric had drawn in the journal showed that the name derived from a small valley a few miles away. At the turn of the last century, the Kessler family had struck out from nearby Allenburg because of religious persecution, although Eric's notes were unclear about what that meant. A family of eight built their cabin and barn in the spring of 1815. A year later, only five remained, and the next winter spared only the matriarch, Eileen Kessler. A trader who passed through during the summer of 1817 was the last to report seeing her alive. settled in the Kesselbrook region for 50 years after the last Kessler disappeared. Erwin Pallardine's A History of the Lowland Peoples, written in 1855, has a one-paragraph entry on Kesselbrook. It ends with the sentence, Stories abound of howling and lights in the distance during the night, but not a single soul I spoke to claimed to have traveled into the valley during the past 25 years. Kessler's barn blew down sometime during the record-setting storms of 1816, but no one knows when the cabin burned. A hunter named Brian Taylor entered the clearing in the fall of 1820 to 
find a rotting foundation and a scorched ruin. There was no sign of Eileen Kessler. He picked through the wreckage and found nothing. No clothing, no possessions, nothing of value. There was only a clean, burned void in the middle of an empty field. Eric noted that Taylor's journal, housed in the Halloran University Library, contained a short account of his journey. The hunter wrote that he felt as if someone was peering at him from the surrounding hills and had the urge to leave as fast as possible.